Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Donoghue. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this, the sixth event in the 2024 Development Matters Lecture Series, which is sponsored by Irish Aid. Uh, 2024 also, as it happens, marks the 15th anniversary of Irish Aid, the uh, Irish government's international uh, development cooperation program. Um, and we are delighted to be joined today by Dr. Vera Songwe as our guest speaker. Uh, Vera will speak to us for about 20 minutes and then we will go to Q&A. Uh, a few housekeeping points first. You can join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. A reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA and the hashtag Development Matters. We are also live streaming this afternoon's discussion. So a very warm welcome to those of you who are tuning in via YouTube. Now to our, our guest speaker, uh, Vera Songwe ha has led numerous efforts to bring greater prosperity to Africa in, in various roles uh, but as UN Under Secretary General and also as the Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa. She's also, of course, a leading uh, global climate champion. Uh, uh, she co-chairs the Independent High-Level Expert Panel on Climate Finance. So we're looking forward very, very much to your, your talk, Vera, and to the Q&A discussion. But in the meantime, I'd like to uh, hand the floor to Michael Gaffey, the Director General of Irish Aid. Michael. Thank you, David, and uh, welcome, everybody. I just want to say a few words, uh, first of all, to emphasize the importance for us in Irish Aid and the Department of Foreign Affairs of this lecture series, which enables us to engage with, with leaders on broad development issues, on vital issues uh, of, of our time. And there, we are particularly honored to have Dr. Vera Songwe uh, here today. And she has, she has, as David said, she has such a broad range of engagements that we won't go into. We won't go into all of that. But I do want to say that um, I know that uh, through our people in, in, especially in Ethiopia, our embassy in Ethiopia, we we heard such great things about her work when she was executive secretary of the United Nations Econ Economic Commission uh, for Africa, um, and which is a vital area for us as we uh, Ireland uh, prioritize our relations with Africa, but also Europe, the European Union's uh, relations uh, with, with, with Africa. But Dr. Songwe is a renowned climate champion and a distinguished expert in the area of climate uh, finance. Um, and she is also uh, listed as one of Africa's 50 most powerful women by Forbes magazine, and was also named African Icon of the Year in 2022 by the African Bankers Association. So we are really honored to, to have you here. The issue of climate finance, is a vital one for us at the moment. We are uh, glad to say that in 2025, we will meet the commitment we made uh, in Glasgow at COP to more than double uh, our climate finance. But we know that financing uh, for climate finance and for adaptation is a huge priority at uh, the forthcoming COP29 uh, in Azerbaijan where we will be playing a strong role, especially on the issue of uh, adaptation and especially on the issue of um, loss and damage. So rather than uh, speaking any longer, I just want to emphasize how important it is for us that Dr. Songwe has been able to join us uh, on a very interesting day, let us say, and uh, also to, to the subjects that she is going to address, I think will uh, meet with huge interest uh, in our audience. So you're very welcome and thank you all very much. Thanks, Michael. Vera, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you, uh, both uh, David and, and Michael. Thanks uh, to Irish Aid for inviting me uh, to this uh, um, very important conversation, uh, Development Matters, which is something I think that uh, sometimes we do debate. <laughs> uh, 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 and and as, as I say that, I want to congratulate you as well uh, for 50 years of uh, development assistance. I think you started doing... Um, Irish aid started being active, you know, many, many, many years ago. Uh, we are celebrating 80 years of the in, in Bretton Woods associations. You came uh, slightly behind them 30 years later, but you've had a lot of impact uh, uh, looking at everything you've done. You started at what, almost uh, 
uh, I think I saw somewhere 6 million in maybe 1977, and now you're at about 2.6 billion in 2023. So huge uh, ratcheting up, of course, of your aid and a lot more countries that you're reaching. So it is um, um, a, a really good pleasure to, to have this conversation with you and to see that at a time when we are all thinking about changing the international financial architecture, looking at how we do aid differently, given the new crises, we're having this conversation. So let me start by also thanking everybody who's taking the time out of their busy day um, to come and listen uh, to this conversation. I'm going to really talk about, as uh, 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 Michael said, uh, the green transition and what does the green transition have to do with development and, and, and aid and, and how we can sort of use that as almost a springboard for a much better sort of development uh, a trajectory going into the future. We just finished the World Bank annual meetings, the big theme here was that we're going to have slower growth and larger debt uh, 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 concerns. So in some sense, we're getting into a slightly more difficult environment, even if Ireland, of course, is a, is a, is a beacon of, of good growth and good progress. The United States is showing some good signs. But globally, uh, there is uh, clearly uh, 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 some you know, cooling off. Yes, it's it's not a hard landing, it's a soft landing, but we never wanted a landing, particularly in low and middle income countries and Africa in particular, we need a takeoff and we need a quick and fast takeoff. So I'll talk a little bit about what that takeoff would look like if one put it in the context of the green transition. We've just uh, finished a, a report and that's what I'm going to talk about. It's called the a Green and Just Plan. And I'm going to put it here. We're going to put the link and send the link uh, to the uh, a meeting and so you can have it. It was uh, asked for, we did it with, uh, for President Lula, Mariana Matsukato, whom I'm sure you all know, and myself co-chaired the, the, the conversations. And here we're trying to talk about what can we actually do. I think many people would have heard about, you know, yes, the green transition is a positive transition, it's a growth opportunity, and how that growth opportunity can translate itself. I'll break the talk into five uh, bits. It's first, you know, as we talk about the green transition, what can high income countries do? What can Ireland do in particular, since we're talking about Ireland? Coming backwards into the countries themselves, what can the countries do? What kind of fiscal space do they need? Where can we find that fiscal space? What are some of the tools that they, they can use, uh, particularly with a focus on national development banks and multilateral development agencies? Then I'll talk a little bit about central banks. And that's really where my first interaction uh, with Irish aid was when I was in Ethiopia, as Michael said, and we had at the time uh, uh, Philip Lane, who is now at the ECB, uh, come and speak to us and speak to African finance ministers a little bit about the story of Ireland going from conflict, uh, uh, you know, getting into the European Union and then having this amazing turnaround that is delivering high growth. And we thought it would be a good example of where, you know, the trajectory that many African countries could take. Um, and and so I think it's it's for me when I speak to Ireland I always look at you as as some as a, as a country that I I wish we had a lot more collaboration with not just on the aid side but on the lessons how Ireland has come from you know conflict to good policies to stability to growth to attracting FDI and to becoming a leader in some sectors in the world this is the trajectory where development matters and development not only matters but development can deliver prosperity if it is well done. How do we start high income countries? We say today the biggest growth challenge, of course, is climate change. We have seen in the recent uh, days in your own neighborhoods in Spain, Valencia and Barcelona, the just amazing devastation that they have created. We saw in the United States over the summer nine billion dollars worth in North Carolina, Florida. Uh, of destruction from climate change. We must react, we must be able to respond. Today, the G20 is responsible for 80% of all global carbon emissions. And so what we say in, in the report is, there has to be a determination, a decision by the G20 countries to tackle uh, uh, the climate transition frontally. This means two things, it means leadership. Leadership, first of all, that the G20 countries themselves design and adopt national development uh, 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 strategies and, and their NDCs and uh, uh, national determined contributions that are linked to their development strategies and linked to their budgets. They must move to a space where they are financing a, a transformation from 
fossil fuel industrialization to green industrialization and green services. And this is very important. So that's the first part of the leadership point is that the G20 countries themselves must take leadership and put the financing in their countries. But the second is they must take leadership in delivering finance for the rest of the... So, so today, 20 countries are responsible for 80% of the emissions. 193 countries are the rest who are sort of suffering from the emissions. And, and so we need to be able to provide resources. And there are about 65 of those that are very low income uh, countries, most of them in Africa, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So we need to be able to see whether we can drive resources to, to those. And I'll come back to that. So that's the first point is that the, it is important if development matters, high income countries must start uh, uh, with themselves. The second thing is we see that budgets are stretched in developing countries, in the G20 countries. Debt is quite high. Deficits are high. Inflation is going up. So there is a macroeconomic uh, uh, stability criteria that we need from the G20 countries, that we need from the advanced economies. I think we see in the UK, the budgets of the UK and, and, and the need today to begin to streamline them. There's big discussions in France, there's discussions, of course, in Germany. I think the rest of us, the low and middle income countries cannot grow and cannot sort of get to the kinds of prosperity that we will need if we do not have leadership from the G20 countries themselves with their own macroeconomic finances and their balances. The second thing is then to create, we need fiscal space in the low and middle income countries. What, what does that mean? It means that the low and middle income countries must, and this is what Irish aid is doing a lot of, must be able to prepare better budgets, do more in investing in health, do more in, 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 in using technology to create more efficiency with the budgets, deliver better health, deliver better education. That will allow them to create the fiscal space they need for better investment. Today, many low and middle income countries are spending a lot of their resources on debt service as opposed to on investment and growth. If you don't have fiscal space for investment and growth, you cannot grow, of course. But more importantly, you're using the scarce resources that exist rather than to grow to honor your debt service. There is a total negative outflow of resources of about $15 billion from low and middle income African countries back into the private sector by way of debt services. We paid $52 billion in debt services in 2022, 2023 from Africa. So there's a net transfer of resources from these low income countries back into the advanced economies by way of debt services. That is killing the fiscal space. It is closing the gap for investment. So you cannot really then be able to de design and develop a system for growth. This is where we need the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the European Investment Bank, and the bilateral agencies um, of course, Irish aid, to be able to provide more long-term concessional financing. Because today when low-income countries, particularly African countries, go to the market, we're going to the market at 900 basis points. It is that kind of high cost of capital that is creating a high debt and liquidity uh, a trap for many of these countries. But if they could have access, if you go to the World Bank, the cost of money is 2%, it's 200 basis points. So the differential between 200 basis points, if you were at the World Bank, I'm sure Irish aid, there's a lot of grant resources that are being given. So you get long-term grant resources from institutions like that, or the same 2 3% market rates compared to 8% when you go to the market. It's so much more important. And that's why IDA, the International Development Association, where we're going to be having the replenishment uh, at the end of uh, the year in December, we are hoping that at least we can come in at $100 billion because what we are seeing from uh, with the multilateral development banks is that the shareholder contributions are dropping. If you take either, for example, we are contributing to either today less than what we did 10 years ago. The development needs have increased, the populations have increased, and we're doing less. So if you think about it, you know, the population of Africa in, 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 at the turn of the century was about 300 million people. Today, we're 1.5 billion people, right? So, so we've gone up by almost uh, 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 five times and resources are, are dwindling when we need more. We had the benefit of the 2000s where we grew quite fast. So we need more infrastructure now, more people are moving to the cities. Of course, you need uh, to provide a lot more. And so that's why the, the, the role of the multilateral development banks, the aid agencies, Irish aid and, and, and other bilateral agencies is quite important to provide this long-term concessional financing. But the private sector, because Africa is growing, is coming into these countries. 
But what they cannot find is the kind of investment that will give them the rate of return that they will find in Ireland. Of course, you probably are delivering 25x in, in investments, rates of returns in, in Ireland. We need uh, uh, um, the private sector to come in with some de-risking capital. There are still policy changes that happen. So to be able to take first loss, we need the MDBs to come in. We need the, the multilateral Development Bank to provide some equity. We need Irish aid to come in and help us with project development so that you, know, you cut the cost of the project so that when the private sector comes in, it is actually a profitable project. Guarantees that are being provided, which we can provide more long-term. SDRs, we can use SDRs much better. So this is, I think, a very, very important component. There is a report that was written by myself, Songwe Stern, where we say we need about a trillion dollars every year between now and 2030 to be able to fight the green, uh, support the green transition and make sure we do it well. A lot of that has to come from multilateral development agencies, 300 billion, for which we can then leverage the private sector. And, and get about another uh, uh, 400 or 500 billion from the private sector. The rest will then be uh, own resources, grants and philanthropy that come in uh, to those resources. So the multilateral development conversation, when we talk about development matters, the, the, the sort of realignment of the international financial uh, architecture is so critical. The next uh, uh, part of course is central banks. A lot of the transition is going to happen because central banks are now beginning to divest from fossil fuels. $7 trillion today is going into fossil fuel subsidies or fossil fuel expenditures. We need those seven. So, so, so the resources exist. Let me start by saying that. You know, if you put the private sector, you put the governments, you put taxation, uh, we have the resources globally out there. I think the question is, how do you mobilize the resources and make sure that they're used efficiently in the right places, in health, in education, in infrastructure, in energy, so that you can actually begin to on the right growth. And a lot of that is going to happen now with a lot of, the, the central banks talking about greening the transition, financing the transition. We need to be able to go from national determined contributions to government strategies to bank financing that endorses those strategies as, as being green enough. A lot of African countries talk about credit rating agencies and the fact that you know they want to be go to the market. We're going to have credit rating agencies now rating transition plans. I think I congratulate Ireland and I think the UK just closed its coal plan. Ireland is, has a plan to net zero. Countries are going to have plans to net zero, which the financial sector will come behind. And the banking systems need to adjust. And we need interoperability and comparability of these plans for two reasons. One of them being, if we can compare these plans, Africa and, and in particular, uh, the pit the, the the pit lands of Africa are the lungs of the world today. They are sequestering carbon that if they were not doing, we would already have passed the two percent uh, uh, degrees and we will be all in in, in disaster zone. But nobody is rewarding them for this. We need the price for carbon. But to have a price for carbon, we need to be able to have comparability around carbon. We need a compliance markets, not a voluntary market, compliance markets for carbon to move forward. So I think if we are able to bring together, so this is really. I think where development begins to matter more and differently is, and more difficult, maybe let me say, it's going to be more difficult, is that we are moving into an all of systems type of development. Is we are, when we talk about greening the system, we're not just greening education. We have to green the whole system. We have to change energy across the whole system. And then not only is it national, but we have to do it because it's global commons. We have to do it inter internationally. If Ireland and, and Cameroon you know, green their systems, but the UK and, 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 and Congo, Brazzaville, I'm talking about our neighbors, don't, then all the effort that we've put in does not work. So we really do need bilateral, multilateralism that works, a collaboration and cooperative platforms, which is why COPs are very important uh, to be able to see how this can go forward. So not only does development matter, but development systems are going to matter even more as we go forward with the kinds of challenges uh, that we have ahead of us. And, and as part of delivering on, on development systems much better is also the financial underpinnings of those systems are going to have to be much better. Financing and investing in this new transition and transformation is really going to be the solution for how we go forward with more success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vera. That was a really compelling uh, analysis of, uh, of what, what has to be done. And in, 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 I liked in particular the, the integrated approach that you, you talk about, the, the, the need 
for NDCs and national strategies uh, uh, and the strategies of MDBs and 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 other donors to be to be planned uh, in an integrated way. Um, we'll now go to to questions, um, and uh, let, let me begin with with one of my own. Um, Michael Michael Gaffey a moment ago talked about the importance for everybody of of the forthcoming COP in Baku. No doubt you're preparing intensely for that, Vera. Um, how do you see the prospects for this particular COP? And in particular, can you, uh, I mean, what are the chances of winning support there for the kind of integrated uh, analysis that you, you just put forward? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I think two things. Of course, Baku is called the Finance COP. And so there's a lot of expectation uh, um, that there is going to be uh, big announcements around financing. But I think we are, uh, uh, before you make big announcements around financing, one needs to sort of, you know, have a, a, a clearer understanding of the new quantified goals, the NCQGs. And so a lot of work has been happening around sort of what are the new quantified goals. This is essentially saying, you know, we've had a number of crises. Countries should go back and relook at their national determined contributions and really begin to see where they need to go and what's the cost of it. Yes, there is a ticket number of another trillion dollars. I think that what is going to be important in Baku is building off of what happened in Egypt. We already had the loss and damage fund that was announced in Egypt, created in, in, in Dubai. We also we had the UAE consensus, which is sort of a financing framework that put together adaptation, mitigation, private sector, public sector, uh, civil society and how all of that could come together into this sort of 10 point agenda of the financing framework. What we should be expecting in the UAE is again, going back to this $2.4 trillion is going to be needed, 1.4 trillion coming from uh, domestic resources, 1 trillion coming from external financing for emerging markets and development economies minus China is to see how we begin to deliver that. What are the tools that are going to be needed to deliver that? I don't know that we will get immediate commitment of the one trillion in Baku, but I think if we can begin to break down where are the resources going to, you know, how much is going to go to loss and damage, how much is going to go um, for guarantees, how much is going to go for biodiversity, which is where it is coming from Cali. And, and I think that we all agree that if we just talk about the climate without adding the diversity part to it, we are not really sort of making the kind of progress that we need. So I'm hoping that what Baku does is a bridge to, to, to Brazil, a continuation of, of the UAE consensus on, on the fiscal side, making sure now that we can internalize the NCQGs, uh, the new quantified goals, and, and then we we'll see how we, we move forward. So I think that's the expectation in Baku really is, is, is moving forward the finance agenda, clarifying the finance agenda, building off of uh, completed NCQGs. Of course, there's going to be a lot of discussion around the carbon markets and carbon pricing. This is potential, you know, billions of, of, of dollars of potential for emerging markets and low-income countries on the carbon market side. So have we making some progress on the interoperability of that market, how that market should work and is governed globally, the integrity of it is going to be quite important. Yeah. Thanks, Vera. Um, I have a question here. Um, how, how do you think that the European Union specifically can uh, can support the green transition in Africa in a way that speaks to the priorities of African countries? And also uh, factoring in the, 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 the likelihood that the individual African countries will take different pathways to achieve green transition. I mean, there's no, there's no single approach. But I suppose the question is really, what can the European Union in particular do to help Africa uh, and African countries in finding pathways to 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 for, for the transition. I think three things. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, you know, I, I I said during the presentation that the UK has just retired its last coal plant. It's taken this long for the UK to retire its coal plant. So it shows that to do the transition well, you know, it takes time. And so if we take, for example, a country like South Africa, where where we have the just. Uh, 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 just energy transition plans, the JETPs, which were actually launched in Glasgow uh, and, and then have been built up in South Africa, Indonesia, Vietnam. I think we need to also support countries that are transitioning. That's the first thing that the European Union can do. I think one of the worries that we are facing now 
is that many many much of the financing is going to the clean, but there's a lot of economies that are still in the brown, and we need to help them go from the brown to the clean, and they're not getting the financing that's needed. And so essentially, they're trying to leave the brown in an inefficient way, and they cannot raise the right resources to get into the clean. And, and But putting enough funding into this transition phase is going to be very critical. I think that's the first one. The second one is we all know the European Union has, you know, we have the CBAM, the ca uh, Carbon uh, uh, Border Adjustment Mechanism, which, you know, if you were, if you were Egypt, 9.3% of Egypt's exports are compromised of some of the, 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 the commodities that are under the CBAM, steel, cement, and so essentially what one should try to do is, first of all, have some agreement on technology sharing. Again, as I said, you know, if the EU is clean and its neighbors are not clean, you know, it's global pollution. So we need everybody to be able to sort of advance at the same pace and at the same rate. So I think that's the first thing. We need to also work to make sure that the CBAM does not become trade distorting, because if it becomes trade distorting, then we don't get development. We may get climate, but we will not get development. And essentially, we know that when you don't get development, it hurts the climate because then people go back to poor and, and unhealthy practices. And finally, country plans. And maybe I should have started with that. Really what the European Union can do is help countries design and build. Ireland has just done its own plan. Many countries are still struggling with how do you design a whole of system, whole of government, you know, transition, green transition mm -hmm. plans. They're very difficult to get everybody, the environment minister, the health minister, the education minister, and focus on saying everything you do has to be with the objective of transitioning or transforming your economy into green. So I think this, if we could do those three things is technology, get the financing so that we can actually do the transition, and then finally help countries with how they can design uh, a bankable, acceptable, investable transition plans. Um Thanks, Vera. Link, link to that, there, there's another question here. Um, I mean, obviously, we all want to see African countries achieving growth, uh, increasing production. Um, what can policymakers in Africa do to, to, to limit the environmental cost of, of, uh, increasing, of increased growth? So I, I think three things are happening on the continent today. Um, and, and that's why I was stressing this transition many countries for many years have essentially grown with heavy fuel oil, so fossil fuels. And, and, and essentially we, there is a transition now from sort of the heavy fossil fuels into gas. And we say gas because gas is a transition fuel for, for many African countries, but it's much cleaner, it's much cheaper, and it can create more, com it, it makes Africa much more competitive. And it's, 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 it also is, is a stable sort of supply. It has, it's a, you have the stability of base load. So the first thing is to see for those countries that have gas, to see whether we can do more of it, whether we can help to bring them to stream. I think what the IEA says is we should no longer open new gas fields, but the ones that are in operation can continue because we're gonna need them as we finalize the transition. The second is when you look at countries like Namibia that have hydrogen, but need the technology for investment, Egypt that need the technology for hydrogen investment, can we begin to share the technology? Can we provide the investment? The technology and the investment for hydrogen is quite expensive, but we also know that the benefits are quite high. So can we do that? Technology. Technology is the future. The service economy, the AI is going to be the future, but it's a huge energy consumer, that whole sector. And so essentially, how can we then help you know, the African economies to do more in those sectors, but with the right kind of energy? Can we do distributed energy? Maybe we don't need sort of big uh, uh, transmission lines. We can do rural energy, rural electrification, more battery storage uh, uh, projects. I think those are the things that we will need to do is begin to find with the supply chain disruptions in the world today, you want to sort of localize or bring at least closer, as close as possible, a lot of the production tools. But the last thing that Africa needs to do is it has this huge benefit. It's 1.3 billion, 1.5 billion people. It's a big market. We need to trade more with each other. If we can trade more with each other, I think one, we do more green. We develop railroads that you know help with the infrastructure and carry the goods much faster and in a much more efficient way. But we generate jobs and we generate growth. And I think by generating better, cleaner jobs, you don't have, you know, 60% of Africa's forests today are under threat. You know, we, if, 
we cannot be fighting climate change in the budget and letting the poor continue to destroy our forests. So we need to get jobs, we need to get sustainable jobs which protect uh, our biodiversity while providing uh, 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 solid livelihoods for the populations. Yeah. Um, Vera, um, a question here. Um, Africa, as we know, is responsible for only some 3% of, of global uh, carbon emissions. Should the world's finite carbon budget therefore be allocated to less developed countries in order to support their own development? Yes, I, I, am, I have been, uh, so there's two, two the, the answer is yes, yes, yes. And, and two ways of doing it. I think in economics, uh, we have something called the Pigouvian tax. If you provide a negative externality, we tax you on the cost of, of the externality that you have produced. Unfortunately, on the carbon uh, conversation, there is still a little bit of a resistance to, to sort of taxation on the externality. And even when there is taxation on the externality, a la CBAM, the taxation stays with those who are polluting. It doesn't mm -hmm. sort of get transferred to those who are suffering the pollution. So I think it, when we talk about sort of, you know, better, more equitable international financial architecture, these are some of the conversations that we're having. On the carbon pricing today, you know, we have a compliance system in Europe, the ETS system, which delivers, you know, $50, $80 uh, per ton of carbon. Uh, uh, whereas in, in on the continent it's five dollars, and then we say it's because we don't have integrity of the carbon. If you made the carbon interoperable, we wouldn't have this kind of distortion in pricing, which essentially is 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 an unfair uh, market position for the continent. So that's one. The second thing which I have been proposing is we have the special drawing rights, which essentially, mm. uh, uh, as we know, and we've, we've we 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 issued them when we had the crisis in two thousand and eight. We issued them after COVID. I think never in the history of mankind have we known that there is a crisis that is about to happen of this magnitude. Have we been forewarned? Never in the history of mankind do we have the solution for the crisis uh, that we are sort of waiting to see and we know how to fix it. But we're sort of, you know, holding back on the investment that is needed. And we know that, you know, the climate crisis is, is exponential. It's not linear. So if we don't spend the dollar today, we will need to spend $5 tomorrow and 15 the day after. So essentially, I'm saying if we can issue climate SDRs, which we allocate to the um, to the multilateral development banks, where they can leverage it one to five, we will get the trillion dollars that we need today to start mm -hmm. fighting the climate crisis. So I think this is such an important point. And, and, and you know, we're hoping that, you know, the G20 can come together at least and agree on this point that, you know, the, it, it is too important uh, a conversation, the climate crisis, for us to keep postponing it uh, for later. Um, Vera, thank you very much for that. Um, the, the next question if I to relates to the G20. Um, the report that you wrote with Mariana Masakata, it analyzed the G20's shift in their financial systems towards tackling climate change. Have you had a response from the G20 to the report? Yes, we did present the report to the G20 finance ministers, environment ministers, uh, and central bank governors uh, under the leadership of uh, Minister Hadaji of uh, Brazil, Mariana Silva, the environment minister, the World Bank president, and, and everybody else from the G20. It was well received, I have to say. Um, and and what the good news, I think, uh, I speak under the, the control of the South Africans, is the South Africans have agreed to continue the conversation mm. out of this report and to see how we can bring it together. So we are actually next week in the, in the next 10 days, there is the G20 in Rio. So we will be going to present the report. I think that uh, the government of Brazil has done an amazing job because they have also provided an all of country transition strategy for every ministry in Brazil has done a transition plan. So they actually now have a Brazilian green uh, uh, country platform uh, program, which is, I think, a very good indication. We, we have raised some difficult issues in the financial system, the prudential regulations that will need to be changed. Um, of course, now we need, so it was, it was received. <laughs> uh, mm. Now we need to sort of the policies to, 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 to change, to respond to this. And, and, and so I think that's the work of, of the next year of COP is to see how we can deliver on the investment and change the policies. But I must say again, and you asked that question before, countries themselves, emerging market economies, low income economies need to put in place the right policies to make sure that you know they are responding to the climate crisis as a trajectory to growth. It's yeah. very important that we insist on that. 
Uh, Vera, the next question is, it's it's a more general issue about development policy or, or priorities. Um, in Ireland, as, as you probably know, we traditionally had a focus on the least developed countries, uh, the poorest of the poor is, is the way we used to describe them. Um, but there's also debate about the extent to which middle income countries should also be supported. And, and this debate is kind of quite, quite li li live in the European Union. What, what, how do you react to that? Do you, I mean, if you look at the, the, the needs of Africa, do you feel that it is that the focus should continue to be on the, the LDCs, or uh, do we have to accept that middle income countries also are development actors? Oh, yes, I think in two ways. Uh, and Danny Kwa uh, from Singapore just wrote a really good piece on that. I think there are two things happening. The middle income countries now have uh, uh, are the, the countries with the largest number of poor people. And so there's sort of huge pockets of poverty in the middle income countries, whether you're talking about Indonesia, whether you're talking about India, uh, Pakistan, and, 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 and Nigeria is a low middle income country, but for, for Africa, it is the largest. South Africa has huge inequality rates with. So, so essentially we must focus on the middle income countries as well. Otherwise we end up with this sort of huge schisms uh, uh, in, 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 and, and, but the middle income countries have market access. So what we need to try to work with them on is for them to improve their policies so that they can have access to the markets at much cheaper rates because middle income countries need a lot more resources for growth and the multilateral development system does not have enough. So for the multilateral development resources to be useful, they must be catalytic. They must be used to mobilize additional resources off of the market. And that only comes on the back of good policy reforms that the market then begins to trust the actions of those countries. Then the rest of the of the sort of support that middle income countries should then get is to the last mile, is to you know really the 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 Calcutta in India, for example, that has sort of the lowest poverty rates or Soweto in South Africa. You know, we have those sort of last mile pockets. Uh, that you know, still grant funding and grant resources are going to be be needed for, and that's why there's been this big conversation at the IMF about surcharges for middle income countries. Surcharges essentially has been the cost of borrowing, which is slightly higher for middle income countries. If we want them to deal with climate, the, the big climate emitting countries are the middle income countries. It's the Indonesia's, it's the Indians, it's the Vietnam's. They need help, they need support, and we don't want them to go borrowing for that. And so essentially, if they can also get additional concessional resources from the IMF and the World Bank. And so I think the EU can do, they also have the ability to absorb technology much faster. So again, it goes to sharing of technology, providing some catalytic capital, and then helping them with last mile support. Thanks, Ria. The next question relates to the role of China in, in, in Africa. Um, I mean, how, how do you assess this? Uh, is it... Uh, to be seen as a positive, um, I mean, what, what, from your own perspective, Africa in a sense is contested space uh, by China on the one hand, and we'd say the global north on the other. Do, do you see it as, as something which, which is ultimately in Africa's interest, the Chinese involvement? I think that the Chinese involvement globally um, has done two things. I, I mean, we're in the United States today, and we're talking about tariffs. Uh, one of the reasons we're talking about tariffs in the United States is because Chinese goods were able to come in and sort of level the playing field a little bit. Everybody could buy a shoe, everybody could buy a car, everybody could, because we were getting it uh, at, at much cheaper prices. So, so there has been, I think, it, it, we talk about uh, energy. You know, today solar panels are cheap because China is mass producing them. And if Africa really wanted to reduce its access to to improve its access to energy, we should be investing in Chinese solar panels because they are the cheapest uh, on the market. If you want to move to EV vehicles, you know, an EV vehicle in China today is twenty thousand dollars. We can move to that. I think the danger is that we need to do it in a way that is one transparent. Uh, uh, if you look at you know what is happening, for example, in Germany and and the automobile industry is complaining because you know Chinese cars are flooding uh, the German market and it's making German uh, businesses less competitive. The same thing is happening on the continent. Is our industry is becoming less competitive because we're getting uh, a lot of Chinese uh, 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 influx, not respecting all of the WTO rules, for example. On the financing side, it's a mi mixed bag. I think yeah. we can honestly say that. You know, Africa's infrastructure development took a huge lip 
because uh, uh, Chinese investment came in. A lot of the big roads, a lot of the big airports, a lot of the big uh, 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 energy systems uh, in many countries, the first power plants were built uh, in the 2000s with Chinese infrastructure resources. So there has been, I think what they were able to show was you can do it, right? For a long time, development was doing little projects. Development was going to build a small school in Little Africa. I think the Chinese came and said, no, we can build you a 300 megawatt energy plant. And every 300 megawatt energy plant that was built by the Chinese is profitable today if the government is doing cost reflective prices. The roads that have been built are already doing well. And But I think, again, where we have a problem with Chinese as well as all, and this is kind of a history of maybe bilateral uh, uh, lending, is the lack of transparency sometimes in the in 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 the agreements that are being put in place. But we saw this before HIPIC, you know, we had, you know, loans from from the, the advanced emerging market economies, European economies, which were not transparent. And and what I say is that ch the Chinese are kind of create do making the same mistakes that the Europeans did at the beginning and that maybe the Gulf states are going to start doing now, right? It's, it's, it's and I wish there was a way that we could just say to everybody, please be more transparent. But this also is a responsibility of the African leadership and the Africans to be able to make this loans transparent, to be able to make sure that, you know, we have systems in place that can make sure that procurement processes are well, are well done. Um, a question in here about uh, South Africa's plans to increase domestic vehicle production and to, to double employment. What can the rest of the continent learn from that example if, it, if it's is successful? I think three things, and and you know, South Africa is doing vehicles. Uh, uh, Morocco is doing vehicles. Uh, uh, I think that one of the things that South Africa is doing well is it's it's building off of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement and using you know resources sourcing from the rest of the continent to 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 sort of translate it into technology. They are doing something similar, like you know, many African countries are doing for the pharmaceuticals and for the vaccines. Senegal is, is producing vaccines that are going out to the rest of the continent. Uh, Morocco is doing the same. Rwanda is starting to do it. Uh, Kenya is doing some of that. I think the, it's, it's first its leadership. It's improving, of course, the business environment. It's having stability of contracts. It's making sure that your exchange rate uh, uh, regimes, your monetary regimes are, are, are clear and transparent and, and reliable. I, I think if, we, if you have that constellation, then you know and then it's also getting good partnerships with with the rest of the world because you need markets for your goods so the the, the african continent itself but eventually exporting outside south africa has the benefit of the european market and to some extent uh, the the united states market i think collectively africa has access to a much bigger market if they work together yeah um there a, a question really about um whether there are specific regions in africa which would benefit from uh, investment in green transition. I mean, for example, the Congo Basin, uh, is that an example of an area which uh, could be prioritized? Clearly the Congo Basin, I, I spoke about the lungs of Africa. So we have that whole yeah. of DRC, Zambia, uh, uh, Congo Brazzaville, even Sierra Leone, Liberia, all the way to Cameroon is that whole belt. I think uh, one could prioritize that region for two reasons. One, to, to keep cleaning and absorbing the CO2, but secondly, to, for growth. It's a very diverse uh, uh, set of countries, right? DRC Congo has a GDP per capita, maybe of $800. Uh, you go to Congo Brazzaville, it's $8,000. It's already a, a you know, solid middle-income country. Gabon is a solid middle-income country. You go to Cameroon, it's three, it's a low middle-income country. So I think what we need to do also is not sort of paint the whole system with one brush, is, is, is to sort of, you know, what DRC and what Zambia are trying to do today is become production hubs, maybe battery production hubs. They have the cobalt, they have the minerals that are the titanium, the rare earth minerals that are needed. And so maybe what we can do is interrupt the sort of exporting of raw, raw materials, right? There is now a sort of scramble for rare earth uh, minerals across the world. Can we start doing some transformation uh, in those places? When you go to a Gabon or a, or, or, or a Congo Brazzaville, much smaller countries, can we build a, a green tourism economy 
So it's a different kind of, it's not going to be a sort of mass production in a manufacturing industry. It's going to be more services. Can we do services in those economies? Can we do better there? As you go into Nigeria, of course, huge agriculture potential. Can we do agriculture? We remember that the climate crisis is a CO2 crisis, but it's also a methane crisis. And so if we can fix the agricultural production cycles, do it better, do it differently, uh, get less nitrate into our fertilizer, then you sort of, you sort of have Nigeria as the, as the, as the big uh, plaque tournant, like the French will say, of West Africa. Mm. And, and mm. so it's a different approach, but all of them will create jobs, all of them will deliver some manufacturing, and all of them will set, certainly add value to the economies. Yeah. A um, couple of questions here, Vera, about the organization which you founded, the uh, Liquidity Sustainability Facility. Could you just describe, in effect, how that works? What is the, 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 the business model there? So it's simple. So what are we trying to do? Essentially, there is a lot of conversation around, and I spoke about it before, the high cost of capital for African countries. One of the reasons why you have a high cost of capital is that we don't have deep secondary markets. And so a lot of uh, uh, institutional investors, when they buy uh, sovereign paper, what they want to do is they want to turn around and resell it and get more liquidity so that they can go do something else. On our continent, there is no market for you to resell it. In the United States, if you buy a T-bill in the morning, in the afternoon, you can uh, go into the repo market and resell it and even come back in the evening and buy it again and resell it the next morning. We don't have this kind of market on the continent, which makes our paper much more expensive because you're buying this paper and you're holding it. So essentially you're making cash is king. And so if you're not using cash, so you have to, somebody makes you pay for the fact that you, you, you're causing them to hold up their capital. And so the, the institution that we have created is an institution where when uh, they buy institutional investors, so Western institutional investors buy African Euro bonds, if they want to repo it, if they want liquidity immediately after having bought the paper, they can come to 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 the LSF, and we will give them. Uh, we will take the paper off of their hands and provide them with liquidity. It, this is important because what it does is that it continues to trade the paper of the country. So, so when institutional investors look at it, they see that those that paper is liquid, and when the paper is liquid, people bet the best assets in the world are assets that can be made liquid very quickly. And so, if you can provide Africa with a platform where their assets are seen to be much more liquid. We can crowd in more institutional investors. It will drive down the cost of capital and more capital will come onto the continent. So that's really what we are trying to do. The second thing that we have created with the LSF is an index. So there are mm -hmm. two kinds of investors in the world. They are sort of the active investors who sort of buy your paper and trade it. And then there are the passive investors who are looking for indices where they can just drive and it's trillions of dollars of capital under management, where the, 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 the asset manager just looks at an index as the emerging market bond index of JP Morgan. And now it could be the IBOX, which is the Africa index. And you could just drive capital into that index because somebody else would have done all the due diligence where you created the integrity, created the certainty. So we've created that. It's up, up on the London Stock Exchange. We worked together with S&P. Uh, it's called the IBOX, Africa IBOX uh, Fixed Income Index. And then finally, we've created an ETF. This is exchange exchange traded funds working with Euroclear. And essentially, sometimes people want a whole Africa paper, but they just don't want a whole Senegal paper. They want to have a mix. And so we're creating baskets of different kinds of mixes. Again, it's to provide more liquidity into, into the market to show people that you can buy, you know, some high income, some high yield, some low, low yield of Africa paper. You can create a basket that has Africa and non-Africa. And, and so it's creating more of the, I, I always say that a lot of African countries went to the markets without building the infrastructure for markets. And so every time there is a stress in the market, they collapse. And what we're doing is, is we're creating the infrastructure so that when there are stresses in the capital markets, you can come to an institution like us that helps you to sort of, you know, uh, soften the, the stresses and provide you with alternative ways of managing and directing your capital as opposed to you know getting into a liquidity shock where you don't have the money we saw what happened uh, to svb bank they had a lot of capital they just didn't have liquidity for the day when they needed it and it collapsed that's sort of what happens to africa a lot is that we don't we're not managing the liquidity flows into the continent well enough and so the lsf is, no, is it, it, it's very very sensible and in fact i hope that that idea takes off more widely. I mean, it's, it's a really useful initiative and, and, and congratulations on it. Um, 
Vera, we've perhaps time for one or two more questions and then we, we must let you go. I'm conscious that you've already had a, had a, had a busy few hours. Um, when it comes to private sector investment uh, in, in Africa, what are the areas that you think are the most promising? I mean, what are they likely to want to invest in themselves? Um, I, I presume digitization is one such area, but are there particular areas that you would encourage private sector investors to look at more than others? Yes, please. And maybe I just answer one last, I, I, I fill in one last point from the last question. Sure. The, 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 the repo market in the United States daily is a $5.3 trillion market. So that, that's just to give you a sense of the magnitude of yeah. the need for liquidity every day in a market so that it can function. We don't have that kind of sort of infrastructure on the continent. So this is, it's, this, this is sort of the key unseen levers of infrastructure that are needed uh, to make a market run. So, so And that's what we are trying to sort of create now in, in, in Africa. On where should where should should private sector go? I think, given the topic that we we have today, the first one is of course the climate transition. The climate transition actually is interesting because it has so many variants. It has the energy space. The energy space in, on the continent is, is is a really solid space because many African countries have already done have had independent power producers. They know what to do with them. These are IPPs, public private partnerships with independent power producers. You know, and so it's it's an easy one. So so investment, and we have a huge uh, energy deficit still. We still have about six hundred and fifty to seven hundred million people on the continent that don't have access to electricity. But beyond that, we have manufacturing that needs even more uh, gigawatts of 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 energy. So it's a huge investment space where we have the templates. You can do it overnight. I think where there is difficulties in the project development, the second space is still agriculture. We're going to have to feed 9 billion people. Africa mm -hmm. has the space, the land, and some of the water, not all now, it's dwindling. But I think that there is still huge potential uh, to be able to do more. Today, Africa imports almost 95% of its health apparatus from, a, from outside the continent. Huge possibilities in the health space. You know, it's, it's almost a $90 billion annual business if one were to, and it's, it's set to grow to $300 billion. So again, huge investments. The education, it is still a young population. Less than 30% of the population is below the age of 19. They're going to need to go, not necessarily into universities, but into technical and vocational education, into AI technology, into cybersecurity. So the education space, I think, still remains an interesting and huge potential. Of course, technology, AI, uh, the whole fintech space is now is, is sort of huge, growing quite fast on the continent. I, I think the, the infrastructure, infrastructure is a little bit more difficult, but toll roads for those who are doing heavy investment, heavy infrastructure, toll roads are a huge part of, of the conversation. So I think depending on where, where one is, there are sort of quite interesting agriculture, energy, uh, uh, industry transformation, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of cotton. I think there's still going to be space um, for textiles and manufacturing in, in that space. Wood, uh, well done, uh, done in a green way. I think it's, it's still a big, big investment space. But in 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 the health and education space, I mean, you know, it's always going to be new babies, new kids. So that whole health sector is remains, I think, a, a quite an important one uh, for in, for investment. Here are two final questions. The first is, uh, how would you assess the impact of the, the COVID pandemic uh, in terms of re redirecting priorities for Africa and how the, in particular, what impact did it have on uh, the notion of a green transition? I mean, you mentioned there, um, you, you know, health systems, clearly they would have um, um, gone up the list of priorities uh, as a result of the pandemic. But but more generally, how do you think attitudes were changed by the pandemic? I think I think of course the the, the first one is is there was a huge realization that our health systems were not ready, and so you know building primary care systems, making sure that, you know, the last mile had access to services. And what we are seeing is the use now of technology. So a lot of, you know, we're adapting a lot more of what's happening in the Indias of the world, where there's a lot of remote, private sector, remote supply and delivery 
of healthcare, but I think the public sector could facilitate, regulate that even more and better. And so there's a huge open space that has come in the education. I think it also changed the way education was being delivered. And I think one can do that more and better. But one of the huge, huge unfortunate consequences of COVID is that many kids dropped out of school. Schools were closed yeah. for two years. Mm -hmm. And we have not seen kids go back to school. And, and, and so we're going to see a huge dip in sort of education attainment. Teachers didn't come back. And, and, and so the quality already that we were struggling with, the quality of particularly primary and secondary education on the continent that we were struggling with, I think one in three kids, even though goes to school, cannot read at its level of, of, of sort of grade. And so, so there has been, you know, a lot that has been sort of taken out of that process where, where we need a lot more effort. Governments need to retool and reskill teachers and retrain and, and even have maybe improve on on the ability of kids to come back to school because the kids then found other occupations that were supporting the families that have not been able to come back into school so i think those are two things that really hit but the other one that i i think happened was a huge sort of self-reliance systems new smes grew but they need the financing so we need to strengthen our small and medium uh sector financing infrastructure because the informal sector we realized did not have access very quickly uh, to the kinds of support that we needed, but they became sort of the backbone of the economies in, in many of these uh, countries. So we need to strengthen and improve on access to finance for small and medium uh, enterprises. What impact will Donald Trump's election victory have on, um, so on the climate finance agenda to begin with, but more generally, how do you see it affecting uh, the work that we all have to do to, to tackle climate change? My sense is, I think the United States, uh, uh, it is the institutions. I think it is quite resilient. I think we are all seeing, you know, the problems. Uh, I, I mentioned what's happening in North Carolina, in Florida, by way of climate change and, and in the world. I think there is a momentum globally around what we need to do for climate change. Uh, my set, I, I'm, we are hoping that, you know, some of that, the, the United States private sector is already doing a lot. In, in, in the climate uh, change space. It is, it is really the private sector that is going to lead that charge. Maybe there's going to be less regulation um, um, that is going to be imposed on the system for, for when we get to some of the targets. But I think, you know, the, the, the drive has begun and, and most likely uh, there is a global momentum. Uh, we, the, the European Union as well, you know, there is, it, it has to be, it's a common problem. We have, you know, one country alone cannot hold back the agenda or move it forward as fast as it can. Yeah. It can support it. And I think the IRA was an important part of providing impetus, technology and innovation into the agenda that is hopefully going to continue. And maybe there will be a new uh, a process that comes with the new administration, but it has to be a collective. Uh, every country needs to do its bit. And then mm. collectively we need to make sure and, and I, we, we, you know, the institutions globally are strong. Uh, the United States remains a leader in this space. Um, I think on the battery energy storage space, on the chip space, and, and I think uh, we're going to need them if we want to win this fight. Yeah, I think that we would share very much that pragmatic view that there is a kind of non-stop, unstoppable momentum. And uh, um, but I suppose it it, it it should be one of many questions that we are asking ourselves. Just, just uh, with the day that's ended, Vera. Thank you very, very much for making yourself available for the um, for, for today's session, both your presentation and the terrific question and answer session that you've you participated in. We really enjoyed having you. We hope that we'll see you physically here uh, before too long. And um, we were uh, really, really grateful that uh, on such an important agenda, you were able to to make the time available for for the IIA and for Irish Aid. Thank you very, very much, and um, the best of luck, uh, well, in, in Baku, but also with your other activities. Um, uh, and uh, we have benefited greatly from the conversation today. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for Development Matters. Thanks to Development Matters, to the IEA, and, and to you to yourself, uh, David and, and Michael, for having me. I do hope that uh, I will be able to come and visit uh, incessantly. But again, I, I keep saying, Ireland is a beacon of an example of what it what happens when you can go from conflict to development to being, you know, the best in class. Yeah, and hopefully yeah. that we can all emulate 
that example. Okay. Thank you very much, Vera. 